Baptism, forgiveness, and the second death, these three are connected, we will see. We know that baptism and forgiveness go together. It reminds me of the verse in Acts chapter 2 where Peter, after giving that sermon at Pentecost, and the people cry out, what shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The baptism and forgiveness, of course, go together. When a person is baptized, they're acknowledging their death to their old life. And they're vowing, publicly vowing, to follow the Lord. And that's where they receive forgiveness. There's a lot more than that we're going to see. What has that to do with the second death? Well, we will see that if Christ did not die the second death, you don't have forgiveness. Because our trust in Christ is at baptism. That we receive forgiveness is that we believe he paid the penalty for our sins. And that's why by faith we believe we can be forgiven. If he did not pay that penalty for your sins, which is the second death, then they're not paid for. So there's no forgiveness. This is the legal side of the gospel. It's very important. Because God is a God of justice and mercy. His very throne is built upon those two principles. God is just and merciful, but he cannot freely pardon. Someone has to pay for those sins. That law demands the death of the sinner. God just can't wink at that. His whole government is built upon that. His own son had to die because of that. So the sins have to be paid for. Did Jesus pay for them or not? If he did, then you can receive forgiveness. His death on your behalf. If he did, then he had to die the second death. Well, we're going to look at that. And we'll see his connection with, um, with baptism. Sister White wrote this from Granville. She lived a little bit, a uh, short time in Granville. I think there's some kind of factory there now, but I actually saw a presentation once in the little house in Granville where she was staying when she wrote this. Uh, as I said, we're going to see how Christ's death is connected to our forgiveness. And um, our baptism is all part of that. We, the Bible says when we're baptised, we're crucified with Christ. If you're crucified with, with Christ, that means you're counted to have endured the penalty of the law because you're crucified with him on the cross. By faith, of course, we believe that. Therefore, the law can have no claims against you. For example, just say a... A criminal is convicted and is punished with a sentence for his crime. When he fulfills that sentence, does that law have any more claim over him? No, it's been paid for. So if Christ has paid for our sins, and by faith you accept that, and you, of course, fulfill the conditions of the gospel by not sinning anymore, willfully, then there is no more claims of the law upon you either. Now, this next two statements we're going to read don't know if you've seen them before. You may have. I've probably, I actually have presented these before, but um, these brought such a, a joy to me because there, there was an aspect of the gospel that has troubled me since I became a Christian. And these two statements, especially the second one from Wagner, in fact, this one from Sister White, I believe she borrowed it from Wagner, who wrote this about 10 years earlier. He writes it actually better than her. I've never seen anyone else talk like this or explain it so amazingly as this. It's really beautiful. That's what she says. Who is going to receive eternal life? Or who will be the receivers of eternal life? That's what it says now. All who before the universe of heaven are adjudged to having Christ endure the penalty of the law. See what heaven judges? When you're joined to Christ, when you're connected with him, heaven judges that you have received the penalty, that you've endured it. Not Christ, you, you endured it in him. Therefore, you're fulfilled, and in him you've also fulfilled his righteousness. That's how we're saved. The law has been paid for, has no more claims over you. You also, in Christ, receive his righteousness. Therefore, you're, when you're judged, in fact, you're not really judged. It's Christ that's judged. You're joined with Christ, and he was righteous. Therefore, you're judged in him, and you're saved. So please remember this point, very important. You're judged to have endured the penalty of the law you have. Every Christian. And look how Wagner says it. He says it even better. And notice the date, 1886. She wrote that in 1895, almost 10 years later. 
As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What does that mean? Well, we are baptized into Christ by being baptized into his death. We're going to see that soon. What that means. And that's what he says. We are buried with him by baptism into death. And thus it is that we receive the penalty of the law. Not in person, but in figure, of course. Christ has suffered for sin, says it again now, and if we are in him, we also are accounted as having received the penalty. And since it is by baptism that we become united to him, we become dead to the law and united to Christ at the same time. This is the, the gospel, friends. No one teaches the gospel like this. Nobody. Forget other churches. They haven't got a clue. And practically all Adventists don't have a clue about this today. But there's the gospel. Beautiful. And if you recall, we've done two studies. One's called I am crucified with Christ. The other one was called by his stripes. And we touched on this a lot more. There's a lot more material. In fact, it's coming together into a little booklet. Um, we looked into the vicarious, vicarious life of Christ, not just on the cross. If Jesus just had to pay the penalty, then all he had to do was come here as an adult, be incarnated as an adult, spend a couple of days on earth, be crucified and go back to heaven. And there's your sacrifice, and you should be forgiven, but that was not the case. His whole life was a life of, of vicarious living, living on our behalf, suffering on our behalf, and dying on our behalf. And the, the other study goes into that. But the point I want you to notice with me here is that you're, you are saved, you're forgiven, because you're judged to have received the penalty of the law yourself in, in Christ by faith. Now, can you be judged to have received the penalty if Christ didn't receive the penalty? For your sins? Of course not. This is why it's connected with baptism and forgiveness. If you go around teaching or believing that Jesus didn't die a second death, then he did not endure the penalty. So how can, how can you then endure the penalty in him? He didn't receive it himself. People don't realise it sometimes, friends, but no error is from God. No error. It's all from the devil. Yes, sincere people, we all have failed to ever, maybe we still do, but God in his mercy brings you along and shows you those things. But... Um, no errors from God. And error always leads to contradictions and to more error, but truth just continually joins together with more truth. And here you see the death of Christ died, how, in, how relevant and how crucial it is regarding our forgiveness and salvation. Did Christ receive the penalty for the transgression of God's law? Isaiah 53. It says the chastisement or the punishment of our peace was upon him. We knew for our transgressions, etc. He was punished for our, for our the fact that we could have peace or that we can be forgiven. That was upon him on the cross. Isaiah 53, 6. The Lord have laid upon him the iniquity of us all on the cross and in fact leading up to the cross that evening. He was receiving the guilt and the sin of every sin ever committed by every human being. That's what that says, friends, the iniquity of us all. And verse 12, Isaiah 53, he was numbered with transgressors and he bare the sin of many. So Christ clearly received the penalty for the transgression of God's law. He's telling you there. And from the spirit of prophecy, Satan's work has ever been, been to find fault with the law of God. But the very fact that Christ bore the penalty of the transgression of the law is a mighty argument. And it continues on there. Notice it says, for God is a God of justice and mercy. He couldn't just forgive without the justice part. And Christ, friends, it's telling you right there, just like Isaiah told you, in the spirit of prophecy, he bore the penalty of the transgression of the law. What is the penalty for the transgression of the law? Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. What death? Notice what it's contrast with. Eternal life. Whatever death that is, it's the opposite of eternal life. Of course, it's eternal death. It's a second death. That's the wages of sin. Eternal death. That's the death that you and I face if we're not with Christ. And this is telling you that that's the very fact that he bore that penalty for the, for the transgression. Transgression of the law is sin, friends. And the wages of that is death. What, what death? Inspiration tells you what death it is. She quotes Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, 
the verse we just read, but the gift of God is eternal life. While life is the inheritance of the righteous, death is the portion of the wicked. The penalty threatened is not merely a temporal death. This is talking about Romans 6.23. For all must suffer this. We all die once. Some people die more than once, but it's still a temporal death. The death that Adam passes on to us was we are mortal. That's not what, that, what Romans 6.23 is talking about. It is the second death, the opposite of everlasting life. That's what the wages of sin is. Christ took your sins on the cross. He bore the transgression of the law on the cross. He died the second death. He had to. And that's why you're, you're judged to have endured that penalty yourself in him. And she says it a second time there. Great controversy. The wages of sin is death. Again, quotes Romans 6.23. And she notes, she states, The death referred to in these scriptures is not that pronounced upon Adam. All mankind suffered a penalty of his transgression. It is the second death that is placed in contrast with everlasting life. That's the penalty of the law, friends. The second death. Inspiration just told you. That's the death that Christ had to receive. The penalty he had to receive. If Jesus received the penalty for our sin, and the penalty for that sin we're seeing here is a second death, then what death did he die? Of course, it was a second death, obviously. Now, some people object to this, and I'll quote this verse. Revelation 20, verse 14. They say Jesus couldn't have died the second death because the Bible says the second death is the lake of fire. Notice it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. They say, there you go. Jesus died on the cross. He wasn't cast into the lake of fire. Therefore, he didn't die the second death. There's this really poor reasoning. Notice what hell and death is. Let's read the verses before and after. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. That's the, that's the wicked, friends. This is after a thousand years. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Death and hell is the wicked. The wicked people who, who are judged according to their works. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. In other words, the wicked people. And again, verse 15. Whoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, when it says this is the second death, it's not referring so much to the lake of fire but to the people who are cast into it. That is the second death. They are dying the second death. That's what it's saying. The people were cast, the wicked are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In other words, they're not coming back from that. They're dying eternally. The lake of fire is simply the means God uses to bring about the eternal destruction of the wicked. He could use something else. He chooses to use eternal fire, which cleanses the earth at the same time. That's what the second death is, friends. It's the means God uses. But the second death that's described here is simply the death the wicked are dying. They're dying eternally. There's no coming back from it. They died once, they were resurrected, and now they're dying the second time forever. That's what the second death is. For example, let's say, let's say you have a lake of fire. Let's say you have a molten lava from a volcano. Is that death in and of itself? Of course not. Toss a cow in there or cast something on somebody in there. Now you have a death. You with me? That's what that's saying. This is the second death. The people that are cast into there and are dying eternally. The second death refers to the wicked in the lake of fire. But we can, we can explain it in another way. I don't know why this is confusing the people. I can't, I can't understand it. This is so simple, so straightforward. But nonetheless, let's forget the terms first and second. Forget the numerals. Let's call the first death temporal. We all agree with that, of course. We've all had loved ones that have passed away. We too will pass away, unless the Lord returns before then. And we know that's a temporal death. We'll be resurrected from that. Whether you're a Christian or, or unjust, it doesn't matter. That's a temporal death. And then there's, this, there's the eternal death. You can call it first and second, or you can call it temporal and eternal. There's no other death in the Bible, friends. If you know of a third category, show it to me, because I, I don't know of one. There's two deaths. We want to call it first and second, or temporal and eternal, it's up to you. But there are two deaths. Which one did Jesus die? If he died the first, which is temporal, then your sins weren't paid for, because there's no condemnation in the first death. Everyone is raised from that, whether you're righteous or wicked. It's relevant. And as I said, there's no other category. We saw that if Christ did not die that second death or that eternal death, he did not endure its penalty, which is the ways of sin, it's the second death. Therefore, you cannot be judged to have endured that penalty in him, because he never received it himself. Notice this, spirit of prophecy. 
talking about Jesus, the innocent and undeserving of punishment, our substitute and surety, was brought under the curse and condemnation that should have been out. He's talking about the cross. His anguish and his dying on the cross. And even Gethsemane, etc. What's the curse and condemnation that should have been ours? What were we facing? Eternal death. Of course we are. We just saw that. The wages of sin is death. Contrast with everlasting life. Every one of us, every human being is facing that curse and condemnation. Inspiration is telling you there that Christ was brought under both. Again, notice how much so. Desire of ages. Jesus feared, he feared, that sin was so offensive to God. The wages of sin is death. Second death. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. If he's dying a first or a temporal death, he wouldn't be fearing this. He wouldn't be feeling this anguish. He felt their separation was to be eternal. He went to hell, friends. We're going to see it. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. He felt the anguish, the punishment of the guilty sinner. That's what he was feeling on the cross. His father had separated himself from him. He was made sin for us, the Bible said. That anguish of being lost when mercy is no longer pleading, that's what he was feeling, experiencing on the cross. That's not in the first death, that kind of anguish, that kind of separation. In fact, the Christian, look at Paul, 2 Timothy. I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Is he dying of anguish, fear, fear and separation from God? He knows he's going to receive that crown. Sister Wise, the very last word she said when she died. To the Christian, I've said it before, is death is but a small matter. In some ways, it's a release. It's peace. In the next moment, they're going to see the Lord in the clouds in the glorified human body that will be, be eternally with him. That's not what this is talking about, friends, but he was dying on the cross. He was received the wages for us. The punishment of our sins was upon him. He was numbered with the transgressors. He felt that separation was going to be eternal. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. The reason he feared that sin was so offensive to God and the separation was to be eternal was because he was dying that very death that the sinner is going to die, friends, that anguish that the sinner will feel. Another statement. We've seen this one before. The instant man accepted the temptations of Satan and did the very things God said he should not do. The moment Adam sinned, friends, the plan of salvation went into place. Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead. Look what he said. Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. Now, if man did not receive another chance, what punishment was he facing? Obviously. There is no, the Christ hasn't even pronounced the gospel yet here. There is no first, second death or anything. The man was gone. He was obliterated. He was facing eternal death. Of course he was. He was a sinner and the salvation or the plan of salvation hasn't been pronounced. So that's the, that's the punishment man was facing. Jesus says, no, give him another chance. I'm going to take it. He's saying it. It's just why I said, not me. Let the, Jesus says, let the punishment fall on me. The punishment the man was facing, which was eternal death. He said, I'll receive that. Give him another chance. Now, of course, friends, is the wages of sin. How much plainer can this make at the sorrow of ages? Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. That's exactly what Wagner was saying earlier. Look what it says now. He suffered the death which was ours. How can anyone teach he did not die second death or eternal death? He suffered the death which was ours. He felt the anguish that the sinner will feel when mercy no longer pleads for the guilty race. He said, let the punishment fall on me, man shall have another chance. He was numbered with the transgressors, etc. He suffered the death that was ours, friends, that we were facing. Now, when you accept Christ and you're baptised, you receive forgiveness, you are judged to have endured that penalty with him on the cross. So you don't, the, the law cannot have any claims on you again. That's where we started. We are buried with him by baptism into his death and fast that we receive the penalty of the law. And we are accounted as having received the penalty. There's another aspect to all this, but um, we actually touch on it in the other studies regarding Ezekiel 18, 20. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, etc. But we'll go into that another time maybe.
So Christ received the penalty for our sins and when we accept him, we receive forgiveness, we're more baptised, we're crucified with him and therefore we're judged to have received that penalty ourselves and the law has no claims over us. Come to Revelation 1 verse 18. The other objection is, well, hang on a minute. She's saying he died the first death, the second death, or the eternal death. How come he came out from it? Friends, that's the very point. That's exactly the point. Until Christ died on the cross and burst the, the fetters of the tomb, no man, I mean, you could talk about Moses being resurrected, but that was the condition that Christ would fulfill what he had promised. No man was going to escape death. That prison house was forever. That beautiful 1 Corinthians 15, that whole chapter about the resurrection. And he says, death, where is thy sting? A beautiful, beautiful chapter. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, what was I saying? Yes. So this is the whole point. Christ went to hell. We know hell is not a place for burning, but he went, friends, where he went to the, to the tomb where every human being was content to go and to never be resurrected from. But he conquered the tomb. He conquered the portals of the tomb. He saw through it by faith because he was righteous, because he never sinned. Look at Revelation 1. Look what Jesus says, verse 18. What the Lord says here. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forever. More. Amen. Look what he says now. And have the keys of hell and death. What do you think the keys of hell and death refer to there? It's not the first death. The first death has no has no eternal claims over you. Everyone's resurrected from that. So there's no need to have the keys to the first death because everyone's resurrected from that anyway. When Jesus says, I am here that was, was dead and am alive, and I had the keys to hell and death, he's referring to the fact that he conquered the tomb. He conquered the tomb, friends, which should have been ours, a death that should have been ours. He opened the way for sinners. There's so many really good statements on this point. He opened the way for sinners that they may have self-forgiveness and salvation. So we're going to look at baptism now. But the point I wanted to bring out with this, this short presentation here was the death that Christ suffered and died. If you don't understand that correctly or if you misunderstand that, there's no atonement. You have no forgiveness. Someone had to pay for that penalty. Christ paid for it. And by faith you're with him. You're judged to have enjoyed that penalty as well. And therefore you're forgiven and you're free before God. Regarding baptism, that is probably one of the most beautiful doctrines in the Bible. It's a, always a time of rejoicing when someone's baptised in heaven and on earth and in the church. It's a beautiful thing. So I don't want to discourage anyone. But I want to show you what biblical baptism is. I don't care what the church teaches or what anyone else teaches. I believe without any doubt at all, this is the greatest uh, loss that we have today. Is, is the doctrine of baptism. We have totally forgotten what it means. We've totally lost sight of it. And it's, and it's the fault of the ministers, particularly, for that, for that to be the case. Anyone who was to read the Bible for themselves, like that brother we, read, we heard at the testimony, he's, he gets more joy studying it for himself. You will not come to a different conclusion to what I'm going to present with just a few verses about what baptism is. You cannot. It's the church that teaches you differently. Therefore, the truth about baptism is lost. Therefore, you have unconverted people, and then you have all sorts of problems in the church and in the world. It always comes back to that. Um, in John 3, in verse 3, where Christ was speaking to Nicodemus that night, John 3, in verse 3, notice what baptism involves. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? Let's read verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Baptism, friends, isn't just a physical act of in the water. There's a more important aspect, being born of the Spirit. And this was a reality back then. This is not some cliche. For example, come to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is what I mean by the fact that it's been lost sight of. To a great degree, not, not entirely. I do not doubt for a moment 
uh, Christians all around the world who are truly converted or truly baptised, consecrated to the Lord, not for a moment. But what we're reading here is not happening today, at least not like it was happening then. Acts 2, verse 38. Notice it says, Born of water and of the Spirit. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There you see the water baptism and the baptism of the Spirit. There you receive the Holy Spirit with great measure, with power. Um, Acts 19. These were the disciples of John the Baptist. These were good men, but they hadn't heard the truth of the gospel yet, but they were good, good men, faithful people. Acts 19, 5 and 6, Paul meets them on the way to Ephesus. And he baptises them. That's what happens. Acts 19, 5 and 6. When they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Again, you see what Jesus was teaching, being born of the water and the Spirit. They were baptised in the water, immersed. They received the Holy Spirit with power. They were prophesying in tongues. They were evangelising the gospel. Uh, let's look at one more while we're in Acts. Acts chapter 10. This is Cornelius' household. Once again, you see the baptism of the water and the Spirit. This, in fact, in this situation, you see the Spirit first and then the water, which, by the way, is correct anyway. It's the Spirit that leads you to baptism. Acts 10, 46 and 48. This was an interesting time, the story of Acts 10 and Cornelius, because it's the first time Gentiles were brought into the faith. Peter brought witnesses with him. And he brings that out in Acts 15, Jerusalem Council. Acts 10, 46, 48. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answer Peter, this is Cornelius in his household. They were speaking with tongues. They had received the gift of the Holy Spirit, magnifying God. And Peter said, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And they were baptized in the name of the Lord. So there we see three examples of being baptized with the water and the Spirit. Now, what spirit do we receive, or whose spirit do we receive? Come to Romans chapter 8. I know some of these questions are pretty straightforward, but Romans 8, verse 14. And 15. Talking about the converted born again person. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So that baptism of the Spirit, friends, is, come, is from God. It's the Spirit of God. We cry, Abba, Father. Look at Galatians 4, verse 6. Oh, it brings this out even more specifically. Very similar. Remember he said we become sons of God, we become adopted sons. It went on to say, actually, that you become heirs with Christ. This is the same thing, Galatians 4, verse 6. Because ye are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So the baptism of the Spirit is the receiving of the Spirit of God in Christ, and we become adopted sons and joint heirs. Verse 7. Therefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and never son than an heir of God through Christ. Ever in Christ receives as a son, you now receive as you are counted as one with him, the Son of God, born again. So we get baptised, we receive the Spirit of Christ, we become adopted sons of God and heirs of God, Galatians 4, 7. This takes place when we experience true biblical baptism. That's what takes place. Come to Romans 6 for a moment now. Let's read verse 1, Romans 6, 1. This is um, probably the best passage in the New Testament that deals with baptism. And I don't think I've hardly ever been to a baptism where this passage is not quoted, which is good, it should be quoted. Incidentally, this study is um, profitable for everyone, whether you're being baptised, considering baptism, or you're the one who performs the baptisms. This is important for all of us to understand, even if it requires rebaptism. By the way, type in rebaptised in the Spirit of Prophecy, you get some pretty interesting uh, statements there. Romans 6.1. We often use this passage here for Sunday to show Sunday keepers that um, say, oh, we're under grace. And so we write these, but, but read this contextually, friends. There was problems in the Church of Rome, by the way, between the Jewish converts and the Gentiles in Rome. There was problems, and Paul's dealing with it here. Not 
It doesn't say a clear cut, but when you read from chapter one, you'll see what he's talking about, where the problems stem from. It stems from this issue here. People are unconverted, that's where the problems are coming. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2. God forbid. Shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, friends, we're supposed to be, us Christians, supposed to be dead to sin. What does it mean to be dead to sin? Let's read verse 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, and that he liveth, he liveth unto God. That's Jesus, of course. What does it mean to be dead to sin? Let's read verse 3 first. Romans 6, verse 3. Know ye not, or in other words, don't you realise? But so many of us that were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. That's what we're going to say, what we're saying earlier. He said, don't you realise that? How come there's still sin in the church? You were baptised. You were baptised into Jesus. That means you were baptised into his death. That's what it means to be dead to sin. And when Jesus was died on the cross, what did that mean? Verse 10. In that he died, he died once unto sin, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So the person who is crucified with Christ is baptised and buried with him. They die with him, they die the same death Christ died unto sin, and they live forevermore unto him and unto God like Christ did. That's what it means to be dead to sin. The next seven verses, or six verses, Paul says the same thing five times. Notice that, verse 3. You were baptised into his death, verse 4. You were buried with him by baptism, verse 5. Planted together in the likeness of his death, verse 6. Our old man is crucified with him, verse 8. Now if we be dead with Christ. I think Paul's trying to tell us something there. This is the passage for baptism, friends. And it tells you there five times. Baptism means to be crucified with Christ. It means to be dead to sin. And alive unto Christ forevermore. Now in your baptism, who died with Christ? Notice verse 6 there. Who was it that died with Christ? That old man was crucified with him. In other words, your old self, that old Bill, that old person with all his wrong character traits. That's who died. Now Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. That old man dies. Who was the old man? The same verse. That body of sin might be destroyed. That old man was crucified with Christ, the body of sin might be destroyed. Again, the old life, the old life of sins. So if that old man is crucified with Christ, that body of sin, can a dead man sin? That sounds like a silly question. Look at verse 7, Romans 6, verse 7. Can a dead man sin? For he that is dead is freed from sin, of course not. And that's, the, that's by faith that we are to hold on to, moment by moment. We are dead to sin, crucified with Christ, that old man not to live any longer. If the old man's dead, he cannot sin. You take a murderer or an adulterer, you kill that person, or well, that person dies, you're not going to commit adultery anymore or kill anymore, he's dead. That's what it means, he that is dead is free from sin. It's a new birth, new creation now. That person doesn't exist anymore, not supposed to. And it's our will that stops that from happening as we yield our will to Christ. He can empower you to not allow the old man to come up anymore. Now where was the old man crucified with him? Look, look how much you get out of verse 6. It's crucified with him where? Of course, on the cross. That word crucifixion means at the cross. When you accept Christ and you go into the watery grave, you are by faith acknowledging to the world and to God, the judge of the, of the universe, that you died with Christ on the cross. That's therefore your judge to have enjoyed the penalty and no longer under the claims of the law. You're crucified with him at the cross. Now that's important. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, all humanity was represented in him. Not just the righteous, but all humanity. That's what these verses will tell you, and others as well. We saw Isaiah 53, 6. I'm crucified with Christ, and the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Therefore your sins were paid for, and you were with him. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them. And Peter, who in his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. All the humanity, friends, and every single sin ever committed was placed upon cross. Christ on the cross and was suffered for and paid for. Now look how complete, come to Galatians 5.24. I want you to notice with me how complete this death is. Galatians 5.24. 5 and verse 
we just saw that the old man is crucified with Christ. Galatians 5.24 And they that are Christ have crucified, notice that's the same terminology, the flesh with the affections and lusts. It's not just that old man that dies, friend, but the affections and lusts, the very things that cause you to sin, that cause you to dwell upon the, the wrong affections, the wrong lusts that come from that old man, from that selfish nature. All that has to be killed as well. The complete, this is complete death. It's no more connection between the born-again Christian and the world. It all dies. Look at Galatians 6. Look at verse 14. Look what else dies. What is it that tempts the affections and the lusts? Of course, it's the world, the things of the world. So look what else has to die. Galatians 6.14 God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So you see, the old man is crucified at the cross and his affections and lusts and the world. It's all, it's all, it's all finished. It all dies there. What Paul is saying there is that I, the world is dead to me and I am dead to the world. That is supposed to be the testimony for every Christian who's baptised, converted. That's supposed to be. This is not some special Christian. This is supposed to be our testimony and every Christian's testimony. And this is what they're supposed to be taught before they're baptised. Otherwise, they shouldn't be. Inspiration says if they're not dead to sin, you do not baptise them. As best as lies within your discernment and ability to, understand, to, to know that. I'm not saying that. So the world is to be dead to us. It's a, and the affections and lusts of the world are to die. The very source, that whole man has to die. Yeah, we know that uh, conversion is not an improvement of the old. It's a total transformation. The Bible calls it a new creation. Baptism represents the death of the old life and the birth of a new life. And that's what the Bible teaches. That's what Romans 6 is saying. And that's what we should believe. Again, like I said, irrespective of what others teach or what churches teach, etc. It is irrelevant. We have to, friends, we have to have this experience on God's word alone. It doesn't matter how many disagree with you. It doesn't matter if people scoff and... You know when the Sabbath has come to test in the last days? Every one of us here already know. We've read great controversy. We know the test will be Sabbath and Sunday. And that knowledge is good, but it's not enough. When the test comes, we're told that the majority will abandon their position and join the ranks of the enemy. Even ministers. And yet they know that. Why? Because the whole world is going to be telling them. They're going to be, first of all, they are never right with God anyway, so fear takes control instead of faith. Secondly, the pressure from the world and from their own church will be so great that they're going to, they're going to succumb to that. Make it a habit now. Believe in what the Word said. I don't care what anyone else tells you. Romans 6 tells you you have to be dead to sin. You have to be crucified on the cross. The affections, it's lust. The world completely. And you're a new creation. That's what you've got to believe. Even if it doesn't happen in your life, believe it anyway, because that's what the Bible teaches. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen for you. At least you're not teaching it ever to anyone else. That's still the experience we're supposed to have. By the way, the only thing stopping that experience is yourself. It's not that there's a lack of power. We saw in Hebrews this morning, there's a new and living way. The old law could not perfect a worshipper. What do you think the whole book of Hebrews is about? That the new way can perfect a worshipper, keep him from sinning. The whole book of Hebrews, that's what it's centered on. So make it a habit of just believing God's word, what it says, especially when they're plain like that, regardless of what the fancy speakers might tell you. And, um, for example, this is just one statement, but Sister White here is um, talking about the new birth. Quotes actually quotes Romans 6, 6 1 there. And that's what she says. When this mighty change has taken place in the sinner, he has passed from death unto life, from sin unto holiness, from transgression and rebellion to obedience and loyalty. The old life of alienation from God has ended. The new life of reconciliation, of faith and love has begun. The righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in us. We walk not after flesh but after the spirit. That's conversion. That's what's supposed to happen when everyone is baptised. In fact, that's supposed to happen before they're baptised. Baptism is just the outward, outward uh, uh, example of what's happened internally. So that's supposed to be our experience. And we have to really come to terms with this individually, as a church body and worldwide. Because until we do, it's going to affect your life, your eternal destiny, your witness, everything. Every doctrinal difference in the church, every division in the church, every wrong practice, 
It just comes back to this. It's not complicated. It just comes back to this. You understand this, you experience this, then God's going to work very quickly with very few. When your baptism is genuine, Christ is now living out that same life that he lived, living out in us, and his life was a life of sacrifice and service to his Father. That's why, by the way, few people experience this. They're not willing to live sacrificially. That's the life Jesus lived. And if, if I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me, what sort of life do you think he's going to live in you? One of um, self-indulgence? Sacrifice. And that's why it doesn't happen. Nonetheless, that's true baptism. Now, the point is, you can never experience this, you can never have this experience, friends, this new life, while the old man is alive. It's impossible. It's impossible. That old man has to die. We saw that he has to be crucified. That body of sin has to die. As long as the old man is alive, the new life cannot take place. Jesus says, He that loveth his life shall lose it. This is a passage where actually love is a negative term here and hate is a good term. He that loves his life, that loves his life today in the world, is going to lose it, friends, eternally. The one that hates his life, for you to hate your life in this world, you're going to have to hate the world. You shall keep it unto life eternal. That's really what has to happen to us. That's got to be the motivation. We have to hate the life that we're living. The whole life has to end, put it to death. And the new life can take place. And that's exactly what Romans 6.4 is saying. We are buried with him by baptism into his death. And as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, another verse will tell you the glory of the Father, there was the Spirit, the Father. Even so, we should also walk in the newness of life. Again, that's, a, that's the water and spirit there. Baptized into his death and we're resurrected in new life. For the glory of the Father, walking in the newness of life by faith. And it's all by faith, by the way. Romans 6, 11. This is probably, for me, the most important verse in Romans 6. Romans 6 is a very powerful chapter. And I think it all hinges on verse 11. Likewise, when he's been talking about death to sin, etc., and alive unto Christ, he says, Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to believe that first. That's why it's not taught. How can you believe something if it's not taught to you? You have to believe it. In order to believe it, it's got to be taught to you. And then you've got to tell yourself, I'm dead. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to the old man. But I'm alive to Christ now. Now it's Christ's life being lived out in me. When you believe that, it can become a reality. That's where the faith part takes, comes into it. That's what I was saying before. I believe this has been lost sight of to a great degree. Particularly, fault of the ministers, where they've not taught it. In fact, they haven't taught it. They don't believe this. How can they teach it if they don't believe it? And I'm going to show you the proof of that in the next slide. I don't think there's hardly, maybe I'm being a little bit presumptuous, but I dare say there are not many ministers in the world that actually believe what I'm sharing with you. And you just saw how plain the passengers are. You know the proof of that? This is the proof of it. And I'm just talking about Adventists. This is the proof of it. These are 2015 figures. 19 million members. That means they were baptised to be a member. So the Worldwide Adventist Church, 2015 figures, has over 19 million baptised members. And there you have the President praising God for the wonderful growth. How many of them do you think have experienced what we've just been reading? Now, be honest with yourself. Don't answer me. Be honest with yourself. How many of you think of us have experienced that? And I'm talking from my own personal experience because when I was first in the church, I can share with you my testimony, the miracles that I experienced, the prayers that were answered in my life. It was just unbelievable. How fast God was working in my life was unbelievable. Then I slipped away, I slipped away. And I've been slipping, in fact, on and off for a while since then. So I'm not here preaching to be more holier than thou. But I experienced true conversion. I can testify before God that I have experienced it. And I, and I experienced God's power in my life in such an amazing way. My entire family was against me. You just know, some of you know this. My entire family were against me. In six months, my entire family was in the church. They were telling me I joined the cult and the sect. They told me that's not a miracle. I had answers to prayers that were so amazing because I was dead to sin. I didn't want to live for God. I didn't want to serve God. And when I was praying and studying, I was asking him to lead me in the truth and show me, yeah, and God would do that. So I'm talking from experience and also from my faith of understanding of those plain scriptures. These people want to tell you there's 19 million? How come we're still here if there's 19 million converted Christians in the world? Adventists. Your own logic will tell you they have a fallacy of that. Because they're baptising people alive, that's why. They want to boast about their membership numbers. 
What's 1% of 19 million, Greg? You're the accountant. Well, yeah, well done. 190,000. 10% is 19 million. Another 1% of that is 190,000. If 1% of them people, now you might say, who am I to say who's converted? I'm not saying who's converted, who's not, but I'm, I'm bringing toward an argument to you now. If 1% of those members were converted, what we just read, in other words, they're living for one thing, and that's for Christ. This world is crucified to them, the affections and the lust. That old man died. If 1% of those seven-day Adventists was experienced that biblical baptism, that's 190,000 people in the world. What happened at Pentecost with 120? 120, what happened? And 12 apostles. They turned the world upside down. The gospel went like fire, went everywhere. Miracles were performed everywhere. The power that these people had, 120 people. What do you think 190,000 are going to do? That tells you, but there's no conversion, friends. They don't understand biblical baptism. They don't teach it, but they just baptize you. Oh, yeah, you get better. Health message now. Go to church on Sabbath. That's not bad conversion. Salvation by works. That old man never died. That's why there's problems in our lives, there's problems in our family, there's problems in our church, there's problems worldwide. Because the old man never died. It's as simple as that. That is the truth. You look at the Sermon of Pentecost, 3,000 people in one sermon. Not long after that, Solomon's porch, another 5,000 were converted, just men. Multitudes were added daily to the church. Miracles were performed. The apostles were so full of the Holy Spirit that someone would bring a wheelbarrow with some crippled person in front of them under their shadow, they'd be healed. Someone would touch Peter's hanky, they were healed. There was so much power associated with these people. And you might say, oh yeah, that was a lot of rain. That's going to happen again. As if those early believers didn't have a part to play in the early rain. As if they didn't have a part to play. Didn't they have to be of one accord? Didn't they have to be united in one faith and of one accord and and, and brought everything together for the work of the gospel? Before it left the place? Of course it did. And the latter rain will be the same when God's people are truly of one accord and count all things together, then the latter rain will be poured out just like the early rain was. And the effect, just like it was with the early rain, will be even greater, it will be worldwide. Our pioneers experienced this early on. These guys, they want to boast about these figures and everything, all this, all this foolishness. Everything they have is because of those dear souls who sacrificed everything. Men like James and Ellen, Jane and Andrews. Jane and Andrews and James White, they died, friends, from work. Works what killed them, man. And this is the way we'd warn them. They had such a love for God's word, they couldn't stop. They had to just keep teaching, keep evangelizing, keep building. They couldn't stop. And the institutions and the worldwide presence we have today is with those men. And then these fools want to brag today that they couldn't join the church. Amazing, the presumption. Another point is, let's say, let's say you did have 1% of that, of that 19 million. Let's say you did. How long do you think they're going to remain Trinitarian? One, maybe one year, maybe two, but how long do you think they're going to remain Trinitarian? How, how long do you think they're going to remain in that area? Now they're fully converted, fully consecrated. All I want to do is live for God. They're dead to sin. They have discernment, they have the Spirit of God, Christ leading them. As they pray and study God's Word, He's going to show them things and the literature's everywhere. Do you think they're going to remain Trinitarian for long? How come there's not 190,000 on Trinitarians? And how come they're still in the church? How long do you think they're going to remain in the church? You see? The evidence shows you with the world today, the way it is, that there is no conversion in the church. Friends. And then you'll get a few that, yeah, they'll become, they'll say the truth about God. And they'll, they'll even come out of the church. Well, that's good. What happens to them? They end up in some other splintered atom, believing feasts or God does not kill or lunar Sabbath or some other window dock. It always goes back to the same thing. The old man never died. They do not have the, he who is willing to do his will will know what the doctrine. They're not willing to do God's will. Yes, in many facets, but not in every way. And so the discernment is not there. So, yeah, they might learn this, but then they'll go off in something else and become an instrument of error to some other poor soul. This is the situation today. This is just reality. We need to come to terms with that because before you can evangelize, before we can bring the gospel to the world, we have to come to terms with this ourselves.
And it's all because they were never taught true biblical baptism. And that's why in the worldwide church today and in independent ministries there's so much division, worldly practices, false teachers and false doctrines. There'd be no false teachers if there wasn't people with itching ears wanting to hear error. Or even worse, those who know the truth but it's want to sympathise with those teaching the error instead of standing away from it. When the true baptism is understood, taught and experienced, then Ephesians 4.13 is going to take place. Till we come to unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Notice what brings, by the way, the church together. The one faith, knowledge of the Son of God. How, how, how united will that, will that church be? Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When they accepted Christ in their baptism, when they died to self, and now Christ that lives out his life in them, they have to grow up to the fullness of Christ, which Christ is not divided. I don't care if you're living in Norway or Papua New Guinea or wherever you are. His people will come together in one faith, the unity of the faith, unto a perfect man, the very stature of Christ, like himself, will be lived out in them. And it's not going to take 190,000 either. It's going to take a lot less than that. And then the gospel is going to go into the world. Look what Jesus said. We know this word witness. We know what it means. The word actually means, the word actually means for an evidence. A lot of, test, a lot of other translations say if it's a true testimony, that's all right as well. Testimony for evidence. This gospel, not any gospel, when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. In other words, it'll be not only words, it'll be the evidence in the life of the people. It'll be the testimony of the people's lives. That's what's going to convict the world, friends. Unto how many? Unto all nations. Then the end shall come. See how merciful God is? It's not that God is... We, we, we think too much that we're waiting on the Lord. He's waiting on us. James chapter 5, it says, The husband then waiteth, has long patience, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. God is waiting for his people to truly get back to the very grassroots of the, of, of the gospel. To examine themselves. And by the way, I was doing a study on communion and I let that go because uh, we've always got too much material. So I'll finish now. Communion is, is tied with this like you wouldn't believe. If you didn't experience true baptism, true conversion, forget communion. You're actually condemning yourself. In fact, and the Bible says that, not me, 1 Corinthians 11. You're actually condemning yourself. You're better on the partake. The communion service is partaking of Christ. We become partakers of Christ. Partaking of Christ, partaking of his life. His life was a life of self-sacrifice and service. And so you actually bring judgment on yourself if you're not. And only true baptism, and this is why, by the way, baptism has been lost sight of and so is the communion service. Have you ever wondered why during the Reformation? Probably, maybe not the biggest, could be, but one of the biggest issues was communion ordinance during the Reformation. Calvin and Luther, they were, they were just trying to worm out of it and coming up with dumb in between theories. It wasn't difficult. These men should have worked it out. It wasn't difficult. Communion is very simple, but it teaches in the Bible. Well, then he's understood it. Hundreds of years before them, how come they fellows couldn't figure it out? You know the story about the Waldenses, how many died that one night because they would not compromise one word. They would not call that wafer. They would not call that wafer the body of Christ, but a symbol. And they lost their heads, 200 men in one night. It was a big thing, communion service. And I was saying it's connected very clearly to the to your baptism. You've probably heard many pastors call it a mini-baptism. So friends, when this takes place, and I believe we're living at a time when this is going to start happening, because you know what else takes place when Jesus says this? Go read the previous 13 verses. He's talking about the end of the world. He's talking about destruction, famine, pestilence, wars, floods. It's all happening. And God in his wisdom... Isaiah says, Isaiah 26, when thy judgments are in the world, then shall all the people of the earth learn righteousness. God uses a time like that to bring the true gospel to the world. Who do you think is going to be preaching that gospel to all nations at a time when the whole world is falling apart? Only those friends who experienced true baptism, truly converted, who died to the world. The world's falling apart. You want to be dead to the world. By that point, the others have all fallen by the wayside anyway. And so it always, you can't escape it. It always goes back to that. Sometimes we go too far with things and like Paul says, we need to go back to the milk of the word. Let's pray. Loving, eternal and heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you for Sabbath. Thank you for that word. And Lord, we want to pray that um, it's, it's, 
it's easy to encourage, but it's but uh, also better to know the truth than than when it's too late. To know it when it's too late, and uh, we thank thee that your word still has the same power it had back then. Help us to understand and believe what it says, and not listen to people who want to spiritualize or just love one another doctrines that have no no true foundation. Without this true conversion experience that can only come from your son, life being fully lived out in us, and the only thing that could prevent that is ourselves. You've given us the most powerful instrument on earth, and that is the free will and the choice to choose, to choose Christ and his spirit to abide in us. Help us to spend more time in prayer and study these things and to seek for this true experience that we need at this time, that we can see this verse really begin to happen and this gospel can really be preached unto all nations and that the end may come and we may not have the blood of others upon our hands for we have delayed thy coming. We thank thee, Lord, pray thy presence for the rest of the remaining of the day with us and we thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>